Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Critical Conversations at SOCA. This is the first time we've been together for two years, two plus years, so welcome. The last time we were all together for Critical Conversations, we had Karamo Brown from Queer Eye in here. He was, some of you, I, I see some of you who were here for that, and I am so excited that tonight we have Simon and Gail here to grace our stage. Uh, and I'm going to have a student introduce them in a moment. But out of curiosity, if you are not from the SOCA community, uh, if you're not a student, faculty, staff, or alum, let's gi l give yourselves a round of applause so we know who's here from outside. Thank you. Thank you for braving the theater. Um, We've only been open at the Performing Arts Center for about three weeks, and it's so exciting to have people in the real world again. So, um, housekeeping issues, restrooms outside, uh, and we're gonna have a Q&A session. Do you see question cards on your table? Uh, we are gonna ask that people write out their questions and pass them to the ushers. There's a microphone here if you want to come up and ask questions later on. Um, and SOCA students, faculty, staff, and uh, alumni, I want to hear how many are you of you are here. <laughs> noisy, let's get noisy. OK, good, we have a really good balance. So you all know where the restrooms are. We do have to stay masked unless we're on stage. So just be aware of that. So when you ask questions at the mic, you do need to wear your mask. And I'm very excited to introduce a SOCA student to the stage tonight, an emerging leader who I've watched grow over the last three years, Anthea Mudanye. Come up and introduce our guest tonight, Anthea. Thank you, Mary. Welcome to Critical Conversations at SOCA, a community speaker series featuring artists, instigators, authors, and thought leaders. These events are designed to ignite ideas and stimulate conversations that we'll hope will extend to classrooms, boardrooms, and living rooms throughout Orange County. My name is Anthea Mudanye, and I'm a third year student from Uganda, concentrating in international studies, as well as an aspiring business leader. I'm thrilled that we have here tonight Simon Mannering, a forward-thinking leader with ideas on how we can grow careers and businesses in a way that wholly commits to humanity and the planet, even during this unprecedented confluence of crises. As an emerging leader, also seeking to identify successful female role models, I'm thrilled that following Simon's talk, we have a powerful and dynamic entrepreneur, CEO, and founder of Kali Power, Gail Becker, who will moderate the conversation in Q&A. And now, I have the pleasure of introducing Simon Mannering. Simon is the founder and CEO of We First, a strategic consultancy that integrates and activates the growth, productivity, and impact of the world's most successful brands. Simon's first book, We First, was a New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Amazon bestseller, and also named Best Marketing Book of the Year, by Strategy Plus Business. It has been translated into Russian, Chinese, Taiwanese, and Korean. His new book, Lead With We, is already a Wall Street Journal bestseller. He also writes of the popular Purpose at Work blog in Forbes. Simon was a featured expert and jury member at the Keynes Lions Festival for Sustainable Development Goals in 2021, host of the Brands with Purpose series with Harvard Business School Association of Boston, and his company, We First, is included in Real Leaders list for the top 100 impact com companies in the US. The Soka Performing Arts Center has been privileged to work closely with Simon because he and his team helped with our rebrand during COVID. Simon's We First value system aligns well with the Soka University mission, which is to educate a steady stream of global citizens committed to living a contributive life. We're thrilled to have Simon on our stage tonight, so please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Elba Bump. Firstly, thank you for including me 
at this first critical conversation after the break during COVID. So thank you to Soka University for allowing me to share some thinking with you tonight. And I want to ask everyone here, because your time and attention is so valuable, why are you here? So who would say they're here because they're worried about the future, whatever that means? Anyone worried about the future? Raise your hand a little bit. Yeah, you're not alone there, right? And who's here because they're interested in the role of business in driving change? Entrepreneurship, big companies, doesn't matter. And who here is a more of a student of capitalism and economic theory? Anyone sort of more interested in that area? And who here has no idea where they are? And you came to the Soka nightclub cafe and you're like, oh my God, we've got this guy talking and it sounds really boring. What am I doing here? How can I sneak out the back? Got it, right. I just want to commend everybody from your ability to coordinate your outfits after two years, two years of Zoom calls, especially the students. Coordinating from the waist down is an extraordinary skill to have mastered so quickly. So I'm going to share a little bit of thinking with you tonight that was, you know, informs the book. But firstly, I want to ask a pretty simple question. Let's go to the next slide. We'll go to the next one. How are you? How's everyone doing? Because I can't recall a moment in time when all of us haven't felt under threat by so many sort of assaults on our health and well-being that provokes anxiety, fear, concern, uncertainty, at the very least, right? The last two years have been, two and a half years, have been extraordinary. And I don't know that there's been a moment in time in which all of us have fa faced so many crises at once, from, you know, COVID, and apparently there is the prospect of another less aggressive but still highly contagious variant coming down the, you know, coming down the pike. We've got, you know, the response to BLM and the Black Lives Matter movement and the demand that is long overdue that we show up differently in terms of true diversity, equity and inclusion. We've got the climate emergency. There was a new UN report that came out last week, and one of the headlines was really subtle. It was just so cryptic. It said, delay means death. You know, very sobering stuff. Meanwhile, we've got Ukraine and these geopolitical issues going on, which have just been filling the headlines every day. And I don't know that any of us here have really had the time to process a lot of what's been going on the last couple of years. We've all sort of hunkered down to make ourselves feel okay and just get through it. But have any of us had enough time to kind of have one glass of alcohol too many, to cry, to fall asleep, to lie down, to cry again and just kind of try and process everything that's been going on? I think it's been really hard for all of us, not just for ourselves, but for those that we care about. And one of the many issues that this presents is, what does it look like to lead now? Whether you're a student, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're the CEO of a big company, how do you lead? Because increasingly, the CEOs that I talk to and the things that I read suggest that leadership is increasingly going to be defined by your ability to navigate multiple crises at once. So we've got Ukraine, we've got the global supply chain, we've got COVID, we've got the climate emergency. This isn't my theory, this is your life. Right now, today's headlines, tomorrow, and so on and so on. And so in whatever capacity you participate in business, I am starting to believe, and ask yourself if you are as well, that this sense of instability, of always being off kilter, of always being under siege about the next thing around the corner is in fact going to stay for a lot of the reasons we mentioned, climate and otherwise. So one of the things I want to talk about today is how do you respond? Because the only true antidote to hopelessness is action to do something about it, because then you feel like you're part of the solution rather than the problem. So let's go to the next slide. The thing that has kept me up overnight, and if you've had a drink beforehand, I so apologize for this moving graphic. <laughs> Sometimes when I show it, and the book only came out recently, you know, it goes faster and people are like, oh my God, make it stop. But <laughs> nonetheless, the thing that keeps me up at night is that we're not moving far enough, fast enough to address these crises. And I say that as, somebody who works in business, but also as a father of a 22-year-old and a 19-year-old daughter, both of whom have told me they're not sure they really want to have kids, because why do they want to bring another kid into a world like this? And I am so ready to be the most annoying grandfather. I got all the worst jokes, and it's, it's really disappointing. But even beyond that, you know, these crises that we're talking about, the climate emergency and so on, they're not sitting there statically out in the future waiting for us to arrive. They are compounding as we speak because they're all interrelated and they're hurtling back towards us in the present. 
So these timelines are contracting towards us. The good news, if you might call it that, is that I see this hockey stick of expectation coming on business where the luxury of choosing how far and how fast you're going to change what you're going to do is soon going to be ripped out of your hands because people aren't going to want to buy from, work for, and invest in companies that aren't solving these issues. Would you say that's fair? I mean, just think about business in the last 10 years. Everyone's falling over themselves telling you about the good they're doing in the world, right? You know, they're fair trade, they're sustainable, they're organic, they're re-engineering their supply chain, they've got more DNI programs in everybody. You look at the Super Bowl, wherever it is, you see brands talking about the good they're doing. Less bad, but not just less bad, more good. But still, with this hockey stick of expectation coming, I don't think we're moving far or fast enough. And I'll tell you why. There's been a very powerful discussion in the shift from stakeholder capital, from shareholder capitalism, where it's just make money and give the highest returns to your shareholders, to stakeholder capitalism, which is, hey, how do we make sure that the largest number of people benefit from you know, what the spoils of capitalism, including the planet? But what I don't think there's enough conversation around is how do we share in the responsibilities of stakeholder capitalism? What do I mean? I am completely complicit in all the problems I've mentioned so far because of what I've bought, the brands I bought, the car I drove, um, the, the bank I put my money in because I don't know where that money was then being invested by that bank, the pension fund that I invested in, the, the diet I had, plant-based or otherwise. All of these things that seem seemingly innocuous in their own right because it's just you and it's just that little thing that you're doing. That aggregate across all of us, billions of people around the world, has led to this mess that we're in. We created it together, individually, incrementally, but we created it together. And we're, the only way we're going to get out of it is by doing it together. Because there's only three scenarios. Nothing changes and everything goes to hell in a handbasket. Half the people change and half don't, and we don't get very far. Or everybody starts to do something differently. I mean, it's not rocket science. We've kicked the can down the road from being aware of these issues and climate and carbon and so on from 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2010, we're 2020, and now we're complaining that we have to change the way we do things. It's a little bit arrogant, or at least complacent, in terms of how we're responding. So two fundamental concepts in the book is, the first is the virtuous spiral. Now, you may have heard of this concept of the virtuous cycle. A lot of brands out there like Unilever that have brands like Ben & Jerry's or Seventh Generation talk about doing well by doing good. And you see it. They do philanthropy. They do corporate social responsibility. 10% of the proceeds of this purchase go to whatever the nonprofit may be. But the reality is this. If you thought about business globally, because I'm really always wary about drinking my own Kool-Aid, because you work with people who want to do good all the time, and you think everyone's doing good, and isn't it great, and we're all going in the right direction. But the reality is 99% of business around the world is still just making money, and, and often at the cost of people and the planet. I mean, if you really think about global business, Russia, China, North America, South America, Asia, all of Europe, the vast majority of business is unchanged. And in that dark night sky, there are these stars, these points of light that are growing in number, which are purposeful businesses. But what's missing is the connective tissue between those efforts, so that they compound, so that the synergies between them accelerate and scale our response to these challenges, the same way that your individual actions are all connected and got us into this mess in the first place, including mine. We need the connective tissue between our corrective efforts the same way you know, that, that worked in terms of the, the problems we've created. So that's what I mean about a virtuous spiral rather than cycle. It's looking at you as an individual, leaders, your company, your brand community, society at large, and then this higher order transcendent level. And it's also about collectivized purpose in action. So it's not just one brand's individual purpose, but the aggregate of everybody's purpose, all working together. And what do I mean? You know, I used to be the CMO of Tom's for a while. Tom's, the shoe company, one for one and so on. I did that for a while. And, you know, even though that was a great and powerful experience, the, the end of our impact was at the end of business or at the end of Tom's. You know, we really kind of self-defined where the limits were of where we played and where we had our impact. And it usually was confined to our suppliers, our employees, um, our customers, our broader brand community and maybe some giving partners like World Vision. But we can no longer self-limit our impact 
to these invisible lines at the edge of business. We need to go out much further than that, out into society and collaborate in new ways and really reimagine how we work together to not only restore but protect the social and living systems on which all of our futures depend. And so this is all about aggregating the purposeful efforts of everybody. Why? Because the timelines are, are contracting towards us. And I got a hand on my heart. It doesn't matter what business you're in, B2B, B2C, uh, B2C, large or small, what your political beliefs are, it doesn't matter. Brands cannot survive in societies that fail. And when the whole breaks down, the parts can't thrive. And right now, the whole, in terms of the natural ecosystem, is breaking down. And so is the social systems as a subset of that. And don't ask me, just have a look at fires in Australia, where I'm from, fires in California, Greece on fire last year, floods in Western Europe. These anomalies, these extreme weather experiences are going to get closer and closer together. And if you look at the UN report last week, delay means death, you won't be able to sleep for a couple of nights. It's that close and it's that real. So with that as an architecture, what do we do? Because I'm not someone who's going to throw in the towel, but what do we need to be doing differently so that we can be of service to our businesses and also solve for these problems? So if we go to the next slide, let's think about me, you, the individual, you sitting right there as a father, mother, son, brother, not as a professional, not as a CEO, but just you as an individual, as a citizen, as a stakeholder in our future. You've got to adopt, I would suggest, a new mindset that really embraces the urgency of what we're facing. So let's go to the new sli next slide and I'll tell you why. Every individual needs to recognize that this is gonna affect their life and the generations that follow. If we look at the next slide, you'll see a couple of different things. One, the IPCC report that came out just before Christmas, the sixth assessment by the UN, declared that this is code red for humanity. You know, then if you look at the next slide, you'll see that in amongst young people, who here is 25 years old or younger? 25 years or younger. Right, firstly, I apologize for everything we did in our generation. It's like we threw a party, we made a mess, and now we want to get a medal for cleaning it up, so sorry. But at the same time, this Lancet Planetary Health Report came out, and it found that 56% of young people between 18 and 25 Think 56% think humanity is doomed, globally. 56%, over half of them, that's my two daughters, think humanity is doomed. When we talk about maybe taking a holiday somewhere, they follow it two seconds later, with the year, we better go and see it while we still can. You know, there's this jadedness that I think has been aggravated by Instagram and TikTok and God knows what, because we're all too aware of how much trouble we're in. So the urgency could not be greater so if you go to the next slide, I want to ask us all one question, which is, what can you do? What's one thing on the next slide which you can do in your personal life to show up as an individual? I mentioned some of the things. Where do you invest your money? Be really intentional about that and have a look about what, at what those companies are doing. What type of diet do you have? You know, it's better for your health to have a plant-based diet, but to whatever degree you're comfortable, consider it. Consider driving an alternative energy vehicle. You're not crazy, every major US automaker has made a commitment to phase out completely combustion engines over the next 10 years. Everyone, every brand, they won't be around anymore. So get ahead of it, it's here. You know, where do you, which, who do you bank with? And where do those banks then invest their money? What's the pension fund that you put money into? These aren't incidental things. These are the, 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 the daily stuff of your life that has contributed to the problems that we are in. Because every action and even inaction is a choice. And so we need to be much more intentional. And when you do that, when you go, I'm going to put my money here, and I'm going to eat this way, and I'm going to drive this way, and I'm going to invest here, you kind of go, wait a second, I feel better about myself. Because in my little sphere of influence, I'm doing that much better. If we look at the next slide, let's go up to the next level, which is about leadership. And by leaders, I don't mean the CEO. Anyone in any company of any size or an entrepreneur who's sitting there at their kitchen table, a solopreneur, is a leader. But by virtue of being a leader, you've got to choose to lead. And what I want to draw a distinction there. Many people who are in the leadership capacity as an entrepreneur or at the top of a major company, they do what's always been done. They're not choosing to lead in the context of the reality of the world that we're in. They're not changing up what they're doing. They're not challenging themselves to innovate. They're not course correcting legacy behaviors. They are just 
doing more of the same and what that meant in the past. But that's only going to lead to the same problems we're facing right now. So let's look at the next slide in terms of for corporations, businesses and startups, what does this mean? On the next slide you'll see that this is not a choice that you can really avoid anymore. CEOs are on the hook to stand up in public and be clear about what they stand for. I don't think there's been a more dramatic example than the last two weeks. Just think about this. Think about the companies, the brands, the CEOs that have come together around Ukraine. If you told me 10 years ago, I've been in marketing 25, 30 years, that Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Starbucks would pull out of a country and hurt their own bottom line by millions and millions of dollars in protest over a nation state's aggression to another country, I would have said, you're crazy. Because the business of business was business. It's none of our business to go and talk about politics, right? And yet you see a coalition of over 300 CEOs lobby the Biden administration to have more aggressive climate targets. You've seen same-sex marriage, women's empowerment, gun control, voting rights, abortion. All of these brands waiting in now, CEOs, having a point of view. Why? Because the expectation from investors, consumers and employees is there, right? Just think about your own life. If you're going to go and buy a brand now, are you a little bit more choiceful about who you buy and how they show up? Are you really? I don't know. Are you? Do you kind of go, oh, I'm going to get that one because it's better for me and I like that brand because I know that they're doing good? I think we all are a little bit more that way and the data really does bear it out. If you look at the next slide, you'll see that uh, there's some very powerful signals being sent by the biggest players in the marketplace. So Nestle is the largest food company in the world, 2,300 food brands. Every single one of us in this room have multiple Nestle brands. And they have all the power and marketing dollars in the world, yet they've consciously chosen to go net zero and also to launch what is called Generation Regeneration, which is about training small holding farmers, all of those farmers all around the world that make all the stuff that goes into the stuff we eat, to migrate them to regenerative practices and to help them to absorb the cost of changing what they do instead of using petrochemicals that destroy soil health and all that stuff. That's a powerful decision in their own right, but it's also an incredibly powerful signal to the marketplace that if you want to be selling stuff to people, you better show up differently because Nestle's doing it. All those Nestle brands in your cupboards are doing it. Another example on the next slide, Walmart. The biggest retailer in the world has announced Project Gigaton where they're pulling a gigaton of carbon out of the air with their suppliers. Again, collaborating in a kind of lead with we way where they see that they're both complicit in this and they need to co-create impact. And if the biggest retailer in the world is doing it, what does that mean for every other retailer out there? If you're not doing it, you're not competing in the context of the reality of the world that we're facing. If you go to the next slide, so here's a question for you. If you have any role in a company of any size, large or small, what's one thing that you could do to actually potentially improve how purposeful that company is? How could you lead, not just sit in a leadership position and do more of the same, but how could you lead to drive the change we need to see in the world? It might just be something as simple as recycling or changing the light bulbs. It might be carrying electric bikes there. It might be having greater diversity and inclusion. It might be greater pay equity between men and women. This is all obvious stuff. But what's one thing you can do? Because if we all do something, it's going to make a big difference together. In the same way, if we all don't do anything, we're in a lot of trouble. So let's go up from leaders. And again, this is not individual slices. This is a stack. Because the more you do it, the more you accelerate the positive impact you have and more the benefits flow down through all the levels. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that we're actually looking at the company level. Are you nauseous yet from the graphic? I just wanted to check. I'm not spinning fast enough. Can we speed up the No, it's fine. So if we go with your company, it's all about aligning internal stakeholders around your purpose and values. So let's dig into that. Let's go to the next slide. This is for executives, employees, and your supply chain the people who make your stuff. One of the biggest challenges for any company is, you know, firstly, we consumers aren't really well informed as to the carbon footprint or the impact of what we're buying. We just get it and we're not told because no one ever really equipped someone selling you stuff to tell you in the first place, but also they didn't want anyone to know the harm that was being done, but now you can do that. But also the suppliers. Most of the products you buy have tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four suppliers. And a lot of the damage is done lower down in that supply chain. And a lot of that is called is what is called scope three, 
in terms of your responsibility to reduce your carbon footprint. It's kind of like this indirect impact that's being had as a consequence of what you're taking to market. So that's why your suppliers are in there. If we go to the next slide, you'll see, let's look at some examples of how companies are showing up in a different way and they're leading with we. Santander is a bank in the, U in the UK and they've done a deal with all of their, uh, the suppliers of Tesco, which is one of the biggest grocery chains there, and you get preferential financial terms on loans if you improve your sustainability commitments. So the better you are in terms of soil health, taking carbon out of the air, less plastics in the ocean, whatever it is, you will get, you'll have to pay less interest on your own, on your loans. So Tesco can brag about it, Santander gets more clients, there's more sustainability from the suppliers. Those suppliers are future-proofing their own business because they're, they're mitigating risks that people are going to leave them because they're damaging the environment. Everybody's winning. Well, the next example on the next slide, you know, Deloitte is one of the big consulting firms out there. Ernst & Young, PwC, Deloitte. And Deloitte is investing in training its 330,000 employees in climate change. Why? So they can better serve their clients, which are the biggest companies in the world. And you may have seen, I don't know if you, so if you look at the New York Times or Wall Street Journal or Washington Post, um, earlier this year, 1,200 employees at McKinsey, which is another one of the big consulting firms, wrote an open letter to their executives that was printed in major newspapers saying, you can no longer support, and our, we, do, we no longer support doing work for the biggest polluters in the world. Their own employees wrote that to them in a public letter in national newspapers. So employees are calling out their own companies. So this is a carrot. We're going to train you about the climate crisis so we can all address it more effectively. There's a stick, which is McKinsey employees saying in public that we're doing bad things. It's that dire. If you go to the next example, you have a question here. What can you do in your company to make purpose, your values, impact, sustainability, a living and breathing force? What's one thing that you could do amongst your employees? I've been doing this work with purposeful companies like Tom's and Timberland and Virgin and so many others for 11 years. And I would say 90% of the time, the great idea that then takes on a life of its own that everyone talks about comes from an employee inside the company. Not the CEO, but someone who goes, I give a damn. I'm telling you all I give a damn. And someone else says, holy cow, I give a damn too. Let's give a damn together. And then off they go and they build a team and there's a little cohort in there and then they take it to leadership and management. They go, well, if you're willing to put the time in and it's not going to cost us anything, knock yourselves out, kids. And then it takes on a life of its own, does well, and then the CEO says, yes, that was my idea. And uh, let me go to PR and press about it. But the whole point is that it's grown, it's born inside the companies. So what can you do with your startup, with your two or three employees, with, you know, start an R&D team or a hackathon inside your organization and think, how can you leverage what you're doing now, your products, your suppliers, to actually accelerate and scale the impact you're having? So let's keep going. We're now going up from the company to your brand community, which is just a fancy way of saying it's your customers, it's your suppliers, the people who talk about your stuff, you know. I, I, I was a writer on Nike for five years at an ad agency called Wyden and Kennedy. And the one thing that really struck me about it all was just how passionate people were to advocate for the brand and brag about it. Every single person that bought their product was an extension of the marketing department because they connected with that person so deeply as an athlete and they felt so understood that they projected into that the product that they bought that the brand really spoke to them and of them, and they talked about it to others. And that's what you want to achieve. So let's look at the next slide. This includes customers, consumers, and partners. Again, we're going up this ladder here. We're going up this spiral. It's an aggregate. It's not just linear. So if we have a look at some examples, not far from here, there's a smaller power company that's been around for 20, 35 years, Prana. Does anyone know Prana? You want to wear Prana? If you, if you wear Prana, you know Prana. Like, it's, a kind, it's a kind of cultish brand in a way. You know, they're very sustainability focused. You know, I've got to know the folks there. And they said one day they got all their next shipment of whatever the season or fashion line was to their offices. And they unpacked it all from the manufacturers. And there was this massive stack of poly bags, the plastic bags that T-shirts and shirts and pants come in. And they stood there and went, that's not good. We're supposed to be sustainable. Look at all these poly bags. What are we going to do with that? And so they, they challenged themselves, just a couple of people in the office, to think, well, what could they do differently? And they came up with this idea of folding their newly manufactured clothes in ways that required a lot less plastic to wrap them. 
And it worked out really well. And they started this in November of 2019. And in the first year, they took 10 million plastic bags out of their supply chain. 10 million. Small company, 35 years old, but it's like 100 people. They then said, well, that was a good idea. Why don't we talk about it to others? And they launched what is called the Responsible Packaging Movement, where they showed what they're doing to other apparel brands, who then passed it on to others. And they now have 160 major brands, all as part of the Responsible Packaging Movement. So let's do the math. 10 million poly bags from a small company times 150-odd major brands doing it. How many plastic bags are being taken out of the, their supply chains? Simply by looking, I think that all of these issues that we have are so solvable. We've just never put our attention or our innovation or our resources on them before. And the only reason we're doing it now is because we're royally, technical term, screwed. So it's just a matter of attention. It's not impossible. It's not inevitable, all of these consequences I was talking about. If you look again at another example, you'll see that, like, like Prana, Seth Goldman, who's the founder, uh, he's actually the chairman of Beyond Meat, which is, we all know, who here it's Beyond Meat or Impossible Foods and argues about which is better and why? You know, who knows? He's now started, he started Plant Burger, and he's also now started something called Eat the Change. It's a plant, um, meat analogs, plant-based foods. And he realized that you can't tell someone to change what they're doing. You just go, don't tell me what to do. I'm, you know single-minded. So he said, let's do a calendar, and it was called the, uh, the Incredible Planet Challenge. And for 28 days, he asked you to do one small change, like here, like swap animal milk for plant milk for one day. Just do it for one day on your cereal. And as an aggregate of those 28 days, he was basically getting people to understand that shifting to a plant-based diet wasn't a huge kind of capitulation. It wasn't giving up a lot. There was still taste. There was still flavor. You still got what you needed. So I think it's incredibly important to be mindful that if you do want to change consumer behavior, whatever you're selling, to do it respectfully and to take them with you rather than talk at them or prescribe it because that never ends well. And if we go to the next slide, so the question is, what is one piece of impact, sustainable impact that you can create, co-create with your customers or with consumers. Think about this, Ikea. Everyone's had a piece of Ikea furniture at some point in their life and sworn when they found that one screw at the end that they didn't know where it went, but somehow it still works and you're not sure if they put one extra in there or it was you and probably was you. And So Ikea in Europe is now selling solar energy. They partnered with all these utility firms, uh, utility companies around Europe, and they're selling solar energy because they want to make all their customers, their homes, they want to make them climate positive. When did an affordable furniture store start selling electricity? That's interesting. They've also launched Give Back Friday, where you can take that damn piece of IKEA furniture where the drawer doesn't open anymore, and, you can, and they'll buy it back from you. And they will recycle the materials. A, because there was so much waste associated with them that it was damaging their brand. But B, there's a huge sort of, you know, full life cycle of the products that they can embrace there. Another example. Like every one of us in this room, and if you're a student, the companies that you're going to launch and you don't need to be a billionaire by 25. I'm just going to say that. It feels like so much pressure on young people these days. You know, if you actually invest the time and energy into working with your customer base, with consumers, and thinking, wow, what could we do together? Because they're looking to participate in the change that you're creating in the world. They're not, they don't want to sit there idly. They're very worried like you are. They don't want to buy from brands that are just sitting back doing nothing. And if you show up as a company that's very intentionally saying, what could we do together to make a difference, they'll buy your product because of the role you're playing in the world. And this is the huge opportunity. If you were to say to me, if we had a few beers and you were just sitting in a pub or whatever, and you're like, what's the big thing you're seeing out there right now? Because I'm lucky enough, I see all this stuff because I speak at events and, and write books and have things. The big shift I'm seeing is away from marketing at people to working with consumers to shift their thinking and behavior. It's behavior change is the big thing that's going on right now at scale. So, so what is one thing you could do with your customers or consumers? Let's go to the next slide. We're now getting up to the societal level. This is where business typically preferred not to play and many thought it had no right to play. But just think over the last few years, immigration, border control, LGBTQ, you know, all of these issues where brands have weighed in so, so heavily. 
So let's have a look at the societal level. This is for citizens, collaborators, partners, everyone cross-sector that you could work with. And again, it's a stack. Let's keep going. There is probably no company with more cause to be conservative and risk-averse than someone like P&G, one of the biggest consumer packaged goods companies in the world that make all the washing powder and all the stuff that we buy, P&G. Yet, they came out after the Black Lives Matter movement and launched a big campaign called The Look. And they took on potentially the most explosive topic in the US around racial bias. And they went straight at it. They talked about the look that store workers give a person of color when they walk in because they don't trust them outright. They talk about the look when a person of color or a multicultural background is walking down the street late at night. They talked about you know, the look when you know, um, a black man is approaching a white woman and the, the, the fear that that engenders or the stereotyping. And then they drove everybody through talk about bias to a very sophisticated website that was very sensitive in the way that it addressed these issues in an inclusive way. My larger point being, they are taking on a societal issue. And I asked the Global Head, uh, Sustainability Director of um, Procter & Gamble why they did it. And they said, we had to for our own stakeholders, for their own employees. They couldn't watch what happened in Black Lives Matter movement and all the flare-ups here and around the world and not show up more meaningfully to them. Whatever the risk to their brand, and they had a very mature and sophisticated um, response to it, and it was very well received. If we look at another example, does anyone know Tony's Chocolates? They're not out here, right? Has anyone seen Tony's Chocolates out here? Or do you shop at one of those stores that bring in special places and special places? Whole, special. Foods. Whole Foods, Tony's Chocolate? All right, there we go, you love them. Well, Tony's Chocolates is famous for being provocative, but they're provocative on the strength of having a slavery-free cocoa supply chain. Because who likes chocolate here? Anyone like chocolate? The vast majority of the chocolate that we enjoy comes at the hands of mostly child labor, slave labor. And if we knew, we would just be sickened to our stomach by the taste of that chocolate. And so what did Tony's Chocolate do? They went out and they manufactured identical replicas of their major competitors, Kit Kat, Ferrero Rocher, and they put Tony's on them and they put them in Sainsbury's in the grocery stores in the UK. Now, anyone a lawyer here in the room? Does that sound like a good idea to anybody? The lawyers were like, excuse me, what? They did what? The lawyers got it thrown out of Sainsbury's within, within two weeks, but not before Tony's had provoked a global dialogue around this issue and you know, generated millions of dollars in earned media, free media when people are writing around what you're doing, which is what every brand wants, free publicity. So they're provoking it. And basically their attitude was, if we can do it, why can't you? Why can't you produce chocolate in a way that doesn't you know, trade on the lives of young people? And if we go to the next slide, you know, at the societal level, Every brand has some way that you can play a relevant role. It might be homelessness. I mean, we all live here, you know, close to LA. When you go to LA, when you drive up to LA, who get here gets shocked by the homelessness that's there? You know, I live in Mar Vista in LA. I've been there 22 years. I'm shocked out of my brain about how tragic it is and how just pervasive it is. It might be access to education. It might be, um, you know, women's empowerment. It doesn't matter what the issue is, but there is an issue larger than business itself that's relevant to your brand and that is personally meaningful to you in whatever capacity you play inside your company. Let's go to the next. And again, this final level is transcendence. And this is an aspirational place where we, get, we restore the balance between humanity and the natural world. And let's go to the next slide. This is really about the larger kind of context with which we view our role in the world. And I, I don't know what's wrong with us. I've got to say this in an inclusive way. We've been listening to headlines for years now and months now and weeks now telling us about how dramatic the stakes are about our future and somehow we don't hear it. It's become normalised. Wouldn't you agree? You see it in the news and you get out of bed in the morning and off you get like the report last week. Delay means death. Oh, yeah, that doesn't sound good. Can I get my latte? Oh, God damn it, where's my latte? You know what I mean? It's almost like as we're watching this incredible tragedy unfold in Ukraine, it almost becomes normalized when you see it over and over again. The same with COVID. The number of deaths, it's almost 6 million deaths globally, and I think it's 3 million deaths here in the US. We, it becomes normalized. 
somehow, or the one million deaths here in the US, forgive me. But we need to, each and every one of us, take responsibility for restoring that balance between the natural world and humanity because without the natural world, we're going out of business. I mean, that's just the fact. So let's think about this for a second. You know, I was a judge at the Cannes Festival last year for the Sustainable Development Goals, which are the United Nations' 17 big major goals about what we need to achieve when to have a viable future. And the Grand Prix, we gave the Grand Prix to this called the 2030 Calculator. And it basically, it's a calculator that lets any business of any size calculate the carbon footprint of that product so they can pass it on to consumers so you can know what you're buying. Because as I said earlier on, we buy a T-shirt, we buy a bag, we buy a car, we don't know what the carbon footprint of that, and then we're like, oh my God, did I, did I do something bad? I, I didn't, that wasn't an intended consequence, I just wasn't informed. So this is a very, very simple and effective interface that allows any business to calculate their carbon footprint and then pass it on to consumers. Um, have any of you heard of Expo West, the big food yeah. conference that was on last week? And I was like, oh my God, the humanity, 60,000 people were there, we were there and all the healthy food brands. And there was a pea protein milk company there from Europe called Sprout. And on their packaging, they put the carbon footprint of that particular bottle of Sprout pea protein milk equivalent. And every two months they update it. And I was talking to them and they said, this is what we're seeing in Europe now. It's not just you're creating the awareness of the impact of what you're buying. It's almost real time. Every few weeks, every time you buy it, you can see, oh, is it getting better or is it getting worse? The companies are holding themselves accountable. Does that make sense? That's the expectation in Europe, who are, to generalize, a little bit more ahead of us in the US in terms of embracing sustainable practices. Or well, another example, you probably never heard of these companies, Modern Meadow or Bolt Threads. Modern Meadow, they've made, they're biofabricating a leather equi uh, equivalent, so it feels and smells and looks like leather, out of mycelium, mushrooms. You've all heard about mushrooms. Mushrooms are big these days. Not just the psychedelic ones, come on people psychotropics and it's Friday night, let's go on a journey. Um, but Modern Meadow is really, it's about me taking leather out of the auto industry and the apparel industry. Because, you know, industrial agriculture, not to mention the horrific treatment of all these animals, creates carbon and methane and all these problems. And then you've got Bolt Threads, which is a company that amongst the other things, including mycelium products that they have, they decoded the DNA of spiderweb and they synthesized an equivalent because spiderweb has all these different tensile properties to it. Like, you know when you look at a spiderweb and there's those big things that go out like that? They have a certain elasticity to them and strength. And then the ones that go in the middle, they have different elasticity to catch the flies. They've developed thread that has the same capacity in terms of how it can be used. And now it's being used in partnership with Stella McCartney where she's created a 100% biodegradable tennis dress. So you've got a tennis dress, you wear it, it gets used, you can throw it in the ground and it completely biodegrades, including the thread, because they're using eco-silk. Again, all of these issues that seem like massive problems are in fact marketplace opportunities in disguise. We just haven't put our attention there. Like think about, I mean, if, don't take my word for it. Think about the food industry, how clean and healthy and regenerative food seems to be everywhere in the shopping aisles. Not just when you shop at Air One or something or Whole Foods or Trader Joe's, but everywhere. Or think about the beauty industry with makeup. Ladies, have you noticed that they want to get plastic out of their packaging? Have you noticed they want to get chemicals out of the stuff you put on your face? Think about the auto industry. No industry is more American, as an American citizen, than the auto industry. Though when my first book came out, the whole industry, GM, everyone was trying to put Elon Musk out of business. Putting his personality aside, he is now the richest man in the world, $300 million, billion, and is arguably going to be the first trillionaire. Not, I don't know if that's a good thing. Who knows? What does that mean? But also, every single automaker, as I said, has made a commitment to phase out combustion engines within the next 10 years. The most entrenched, iconic American industry within a decade has totally phased out their lifeblood, which was oil and gas. So things are changing. Things are shifting because they need to, and they're being driven by companies that want to mitigate risk and 
make sure their rep reputation is going to be okay. It's being driven by investors who don't want to put money in companies that aren't going to be set up to succeed in the future. It's driven by employees who are saying, I don't want to work for companies that are doing bad. Screw this, I'm out of here. The great resignation, thank you very much. It's being driven by consumers who are standing there on the shopping aisle and looking at the back of packaging and, and really assessing whether they think it's good for their family, good for their kids, good for the planet, good for their future. It's kind of like the change is being driven from all sides now. We can't escape it. Why? It's not like we all woke up and grew a conscience. It's because of these damn phones in our pockets every day tell us how much trouble we're in. Every day you look at the headlines. What I do is I go, ha! Huh! You know, I look and go, oh my God, that's so bad. Because I've got to manage my own mental health in all of this. If you watch the news all day, it's a miracle we all don't slash our wrists. You know? So let's go through. I mean, what is one ambitious goal that you could set some higher order aspiration on behalf of your company and your industry, and who could you partner with to achieve that? Who could you work with as a competitor, like Prana did with other fashion brands around the responsible packaging movement? Who could you work with as a non-profit that will sort of demonstrate your commitment to making a difference? Who could you work with and advocate with in policy, in, in, the, in the world of government and policy making to drive change? And then let's go to the next slide. So I, I, what I want you to take away from this is that in very simple terms, we got in this mess together and the only way out is together. And one of the things I'm most concerned about is that business is showing up, the investor class is showing up with ESG funds and things like that, the press is all over it, you know, consumers are more conscious, but I don't know that we're fully aware of just how complacent we all are as individuals in the way we are in our daily lives. Because for some reason we don't realize that every choice we're making in terms of the things I mentioned before, have a consequence. They have an impact. And if you want to know what that impact looks like, look at the situation we're in. We created it together. And so what my great hope is that Lead With We is a, a simple decision-making filter, where if you're in a company, if you're a startup, you're a solopreneur, you're a student, you've already got an idea, or if you're the CEO of a major corporation, you can say, well, wait a second, before I make this decision around payroll, R&D, whatever it might be, wherever you are in a company, you can say, how do I choose to consciously lead in terms of the change we want to see in the world? How do I do it with as many stakeholders as possible? And how do I benefit the largest we in terms of the greatest number of people on the planet? Because it's the same aggre you know, aggregating, compounding, synergistic mindset that is actually informing or creating the problems that we're in right now. It's just the inverse. And you might say, if you go to the next slide, why is this possible now? We've been talking about business doing good forever. And I, and I will admit to you, I think there's three forces working against us that work really, that are very concerning. One is legacy industries. A lot of these industries don't want to go down without a fight. They're incredibly well resourced, they've got gobs of money, they're very well organized, they've got misinformation, they'll lie, they'll obfuscate, and they'll try and leave things unchanged because they're making so much money. Secondly, you've got in certain parts of the world an aspiring middle class that want their day in the sun at the banquet table of capitalism. It might be India, it might be China who are saying, wait a second, I want my flat screens and my five phones and my whatever, whatever that I've seen in what is now called the global north. You know, countries like the US, like Australia, like the UK. And then tragically, there is the vast majority and growing majority of people that live on $6 or $10 a day or less, for whom the luxury of trying to improve the future is simply not on the table. They're just trying to eat, find water that won't make them sick and not have to do water portage as a mother for four hours one way each day. Or they just want to be able to go to school because they have access to water or a pair of shoes. So, you know, are they going to wade into this conversation? No, they're just trying to survive. So I think those three forces are working against us and you need to take everybody with you. You can't just say, well, we're going to fix it for ourselves and leave everyone else behind because that's, no, that's not a viable solution. But in the good news column, I think for the first time we're seeing three things come together that I've never seen happen before. The first is the stakes, as in we are on point. We know we're in trouble. We, everyone here knows that humanity is facing an existential crisis. If not in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, judging by the way we're going, there's a good chance we're going to go out of business. And that's nutty. I mean, can I say something that drives me crazy? All the species on the planet, right? And that climate report that came out last week, they said that in addition to 800 million to 3 billion people having lack of access to clean water, and that's going to create climate refugees, 
said, if we don't fix what we're doing now by 2040, 29% of species on land and in the ocean will be lost. 29%. And this report was ratified by 195 countries and 67 research institutes. That's 30% of the living creatures on this planet. Every one of us, I don't know about you, but I've had those moments where you just look at something and go, God, that is just not right. That's so wrong, whatever happened to that species or that thing went extinct or that's one. And imagine that on this massive scale. And the knock-on effect of that in terms of biodiversity, all the links in the chain of biodiversity, is quite staggering. So the stakes are there. As I mentioned, though, what's so exciting is all the stakeholders are at the table for the first time. So it's not just the consumers. It's not just customers. It's not just leaders talking about it. It's not just suppliers. It's not just employees. Most importantly, the investor class is there. Whether it's Larry Fink, who manages the largest um, money management firm in the world, BlackRock, with 10.3 trillion under management, or whether it's the CEOs of B Corps or the Business Roundtable, they're all talking about the business needs to show up differently. The capitalism, which we all embrace, needs to evolve again to better serve more people in our future. And then thirdly, we've got this story. We've got this new narrative emerging. We're all feeling it. I asked you at the beginning, did you see that? Are you seeing more brands talking about it? And that first 15%, that first turn of the wheel is the hardest because the longer you go, the more it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, the more momentum you get and the easier it gets. So if you think it's hard right now, it's because it's, we've been driving to a cliff at 100 miles an hour and we kept leaving it and everyone's like, should we go left? No, we'll keep going. We're going left. We just keep going. We're right at the edge of the cliff and now we're like, we've got to throw the wheel hard and we don't like how that feels, but we've left it till the last minute. One minute till midnight was the headline from Boris Johnson at COP26 a few, a few months ago. If we go to the next slide. With those three things in mind, this sort of coincidence, this conspiracy of circumstances, my personal belief is that if we do choose to lead with we as a mindset, as a process, as the decision-making filter, and as a higher order aspiration, which simply means we would like to all lead in our individual capacity so that everyone, the collective, can do better. Why? So that your business can thrive. Your kid can have a future to look forward to. Nature doesn't get sort of hemorrhaged every single day. If the whole breaks down, the parts can't survive. And companies, brands can't survive in societies that fail. And the, the whole is breaking down right now. So we need to aspire to lead with we. If we go to the next slide, I deeply believe in the innate goodness of humanity. And I don't think we're going to allow ourselves to go out of business. So I don't want you to think that there's anything negative about this. But I do believe that we had to get to this acute moment of urgency before we were going to pay attention. Because I don't know what it is, we're sentient beings, we're conscious beings, we just, we get arrogant, we get complacent, and we've left it to the last minute before we need to do something different. But I don't actually see this as the end of something. I see this as the beginning of the most miraculous renaissance of business that we've ever seen. It's going to be painful. In fact, it's like a birth. It's appropriately painful. But on the other side is the beginning of a practice of business more broadly where we work with the natural world rather than stealing from it. And we actually regenerate and restore the natural world rather than stealing from it. And when we do that and we recognize the innate and inherent abundance of the natural world, because that's what it does, it naturally regenerates. Look at COVID, we left the world alone for a minute and it just burst into bloom. We will fall in love with the natural world all over again. And we will start to see a new renaissance for business, a new way of existing in the world. And I honestly believe that we're going to look back in 10 or 20 years and go, what the hell were we thinking before? Because we realize now that littered around us every day are biological blueprints that can solve for all the issues we want and all the needs that we have in our lives in a way that can actually restore and protect the natural world. But we're only going to get there if we do it together and my great hope for all of us is that we lead with we. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Um, and now, allow me to introduce Gail Becker. Gail is the founder and CEO of Kali Power, one of the fastest growing food brands that produces cauliflower-based foods with more than 100 
$1.6 million in annual sales and named top 10 world's most innovative food companies in 2022. Gail took a huge risk and quit a high-level corporate job in 2016 to start this frozen food company specializing in gluten-free crusts. Her philosophy is best captured in her quote, it's better to say oops than what if. Her risk and hard work has paid off. In addition to increasing sales to over 100 million, she was named as one of Forbes 50 over 50 and Fast Company magazine named Kali Power in its list of top 10 most innovative food companies of 2022. And now, I agree with all the good press. I've tried Kali Power pizza, and all I can say is, wow, it was so good, I almost didn't believe that it was gluten-free. And it's just one of a whole line of tasty options. In honor of Women's History Month, we are particularly delighted to have such a strong, impactful, compassionate leader and entrepreneur on our stage. Let's welcome Gail Becker. Wow, that was really amazing. Thank you. Um, so much. Um, and I'm just going to give everyone a reminder that we are opening it up to questions at the end. So uh, please think of, uh, please start thinking of them. The okay. nasty ones, the really hard ones, the yeah. annoying ones. Go for those. Exactly, please. exactly. So I love how you opened the presentation because you opened it up with all the images that have kept us all awake over the last couple of years. Um, and you ended on such a optimistic note. So I guess my question is, why do you feel so positive about the future? I think uh, we, I think I'm an innately positive person, otherwise I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And I think, who would say that they're positive by nature? Can I just see, right? Okay, so like the majority of us, some people are like, man, I'm so dark, you don't wanna know me, you know? So I think there's part of that, but there's a, Gail and I were talking earlier, I don't think we have a choice, because if we give up, it's over. It really is over. Like, it's his fault, it's your fault, it's their fault, they should fix it, but it's over. If we sort of half try, we're not going to get there in time. The, the, the ship has already sailed. There's things in motion right now that are very hard to stop. So I've actually thought about this a lot and talked to a lot of people in the space about it. And being optimistic is a conscious choice because I believe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that if I believe I can make a little bit of a difference, hopefully by maybe speaking to some of you tonight or working with some companies and helping them do what they're doing, then that's a little bit of a movement in the right direction. And then someone else does it and someone else does it. And, and as I said, that getting it off the ground is the hard bit because we've been doing it this way forever. We've just got to course correct and it'll take on a life of its own. The market forces will increasingly reward companies doing good if we support it sufficiently. It will be the new normal. And so I have consciously, even though I'm mildly, no, not mildly, I'm very, 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 very concerned on a daily basis, I'm consciously choosing to be optimistic because I think it's the only viable alternative, I think it's the most effective solution, and I think we all need to be that way and we need to hold arms together and go like hell. What do you think is most misunderstood about your message? Most misunderstood, I mean, Sometimes people, when they hear me talk about capitalism better serving more people, they think it's socialism and they sort of dismiss it. And they've got, you know, firstly, there's a problem with thinking that any one of these sort of economic theories are static. They've all changed over the years, depending on economic theory, political parties, and, and the context, the cultural context of the time. But, you know, it's almost like we pigeonhole things in a TikTok attention span these days. Capitalism is bad, socialism is bad, or, or whatever. My fundamental presumption of capitalism, and we don't need to go into the, you know, all the theory of capitalism and so on, you know, is that it was really designed to create prosperity that serves the greatest number of people so that you can have a thriving economy and, and, and so on. And so sometimes I feel like people misunderstand that this is somehow a threat to capitalism or a disregard of capitalism when really it's just that, no, it's a belief that capitalism needs to evolve. Why? Because the conditions we've created by the practice of capitalism that we've done up till now is threatening our survival. And so we need to do something different. I'm gonna ask a, a personal question or a question on my own behalf if I, if I can. What is the right way for a brand to talk about the good they do? 
it's interesting and just even the way that people talk about Kali Power, it's, you know, how much revenue we've made or sort of what lists we've made. We, we build teaching gardens in underserved schools across the country. We have since we sold our very first pizza. I can't get anyone to talk about it. I, and I'm, I'm curious, and I want people to know. Um, it's my reason for leaving corporate America in the first place. So it was, you know, it is core to who we are. But sometimes I feel like people don't care. Well, I'll, I'll give you three reasons. And we do that... Th like, writing books and speaking is just a little thing I do on the side. We are 95% of our time doing this for real with real companies. So what I'm going to share is based on a practitioner's opinion. Um, the first thing is that a lot of companies don't differentiate themselves sufficiently. So people don't really know what to say. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean? There are so many do-good companies out there, it seems. Everyone's falling over themselves in the shopping aisles, as you saw. If you go to Expo West, you're like, I'm never going to eat anything ever again. Right. There's so many do-good brands. So no one has done the work to actually define what is their unique point of view on sustainability or regenerative practices or whatever it might be. And in the absence of that, oh, people know that you're one of those brands that do good in that area, but they, they're not equipped to speak about you. The second thing is, even if you've done that, what would I say? I'd say probably 80% of do-good brands talk about what they're doing in a self-directed way. My tortilla chip company does X and our, our employees volunteer these hours and we source our ingredients from these things. No one listens to that because they're talking about themselves. Instead, you need to be the celebrant, not celebrity, of your community. Don't put the spotlight on you. Put the spotlight on your suppliers, on your employees, what you're doing and co-creating with your customers. If you look at those brands that do this really well, they are always ce celebrating their, their customers. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, they, um, Patagonia is just an obvious one. They have um, a campaign which is all about how every one of their jackets tells a story. Everyone, everything that they wear tells a story. And all they did was get their customers to share the emotional story that is infused in the product that they bought like the emotional fabric of what they wear, not just that jacket. It's the jacket that they climbed the hill of Malayas in 10 times or, you know, navigated on a raft that river. They talked about the emotional fabric. They put their, the, the customers on a pedestal. So that's the second thing. Don't talk in a self-directed way. Be the celebrant, not um, celebrity. And then I think, you know, the big, big miss on behalf of most companies out there is they're failing to recognise that all stakeholders, but especially consumers, want to create the impact with them. Mm -hmm. They almost have this legacy mindset of, oh, uh, TV, print, and radio. You tell people what to think and you tell them what to buy. That day is gone. Mm -hmm. You've got to, as I said about consumer behavior, you've got to create opportunities for people to participate where they are loyal to a brand and buy its product because they want to co-create the future that you've articulated on the strength of your role in the world. And so if you get any one of those wrong, you're dead in the water. And I, and I think one of the challenges for a lot of do-good brands is there's like 10 things you've got to get right in a row for it to take on a life of its own and become a movement and it's just like, oh, my God, how does that brand do it all the time? But if you get one of them wrong, it breaks the chain between them from leadership to culture to community to society. And then they're going, well, I'm getting all of this right. Why is it not working? Mm -hmm. So, you know, really be differentiated to others, be the celebrant, and be co-creative as you strategize how you're going to engage customers. And if they're going to... I'll give you one example. Just because I don't hate theory. Um, Dove. You know Dove Soap? And they've had this long campaign about real beauty. In 2019, they did a campaign, um, and it was called Show Us. Mm -hmm. And they got all these women around the world, real women, just like you, to send in unretouched photos of themselves and they created a free stock library for advertisers anywhere in the world to use. Why? Their purpose is to make beauty a source of confidence, not anxiety. And they want to address the objectification and sexualization of women. Who causes that? Advertisers. How do they do it? Photography of women. What do we do to fix that problem? Let's create a free stock library of real women that are unretouched. How did they do it? They actually got their customers to send in their photos. That's co-creating a movement yeah that elevates the brand, and for God's sake, it's just soap. It's the same stuff with a different fragrance. If they can do it, anyone can. 
I love that. And is the onus also on consumers that we have to have a responsibility when we go to the store to buy those brands? What can we do beside read the back of the box? Yeah. It's really interesting. There's an onus on both sides. As a incredibly successful and impactful brand, congratulations, you know, you know that you've got to go to a retailer with a story that's going to be compelling enough for them to give you some shelf space. Because mm -hmm. it's a fight every day for shelf space. It's absolutely brutal. I don't know how. I started my hair with straight, is what happened. Right? <laughs> and on the, by the same token, consumers need to be distrustful and cynical. And if you look at things like the Ed Edelman's Trust Barometer Report that comes out each year, it's a pretty dense and broad consumer study from around the world. And by and large, consumers don't trust marketing, they don't trust institutions, they trust their friends more, they trust employees, and there's an onus on them to do their own research to see if they really believe that what a company is saying is what it's actually doing. The good news is, is that our BS radars are so highly attuned these days. I mean, my default position when I look at anything is, I don't trust you until you prove me otherwise because marketing is marketing. And I think all of us now have been burnt so many times that we don't trust what we're told out of the gate. And so, yes, there is an onus on us to be choiceful in what we buy, but then to verify on our own as well. Do you think that women uh, in business approach the notion of leading with we differently than men? You know, I, I will give you a top of mind answer, but it's not one substantiated by a lot of research, which I prefer. But in my observation of having been in absolutely breathless, windowless corporate rooms <laughs> for about 25 years, is there is a greater capacity and predisposition and readiness for emotional intelligence or being heart-led in the decision-making process in women than in men. And I say this with all respect and love to all the men in the room. We are just so crazy sometimes. It becomes this silly competition, ego. There is certainly a lot of chemistry and instincts that reinforce that and so on. But I do think we have to work harder, especially in the context of a majority of other men in the room, to lead with our, he our heart rather than our head and to make decisions that better serve more stakeholders rather than be some thinly veiled expression of your own ego or your success or bragging rights of the company. But that's a pretty gross generalization. I know you all so well, I apologize so intimately to you all. But I, I do think that in my observation of corporate life for the last 30 years, I'd say that's fair. Uh, you use the word success, and I think, you know, it has such a vastly, it can have such a vastly different meaning for, for so many different people. How do you think you know, we should define success today? How should businesses define success? How should CEOs define success and, and as us as individuals? I like to think of success this way, in that we need to embrace a collaborative mindset that allows us to work in new ways that restore and protect the natural and social systems on which all of our futures depend. And we need to be as selfish as we possibly can be because the harder we work to restore the natural world and to shore up the societies that make our businesses possible, the better chance we have of growing our businesses. And there's a really interesting moment in time right now where this slow-turning ocean liner is pointing in a direction towards change. Whether we turn far enough, fast enough, let's hope we do, but we'll see. But the market forces are shifting. And those who are waiting and not changing run the risk of being slipping off the back of the wave. And those who wait to the last minute might just go over the edge and be carried forward. But in my experience, those who are getting ahead of it, just by their own observation, they're at the front of the wave and the, and the market forces are going to push them forward. They're going to be on the right side of history. So my big caution to brands is be really, really careful about how cautious you are or whether you want to be third or fourth or 90th in your category to do it because the marketplace is going to be very unforgiving when investors, employees, consumers, customers, partners rip away the social license to operate of any company that is not aggressively 
fixing a problem, and that is coming very fast. Okay, well, I think now is the time that we're going to open it up to Q&A. Um, I could go on like this all night. Such interesting topics. Um, okay, uh, do we have some? Poke holes. Uh, Question. I think, um, Mary, you want people to hand them to you, or you can come to the microphone with a mask. Is that correct? I'm going to give the Q&A rules one more time. So why don't we have ushers walking around now. If you have a question already filled out, just hold it up and someone will grab it. If you're uh, bold enough to step up to the mic, too, we will take people at the mic with masks on. But we will start with one of your former colleagues' question. I'm just going to hand them to Gail. Oh, OK. Sure, great. History question. OK. Where is Wall Street when it comes to leading with we? How can we truly create this renaissance when there is such a focus on short-term profits? Yeah, I mean, I'm as cynical as everyone else in the room. It's always about the money. It's always about the money. Anyone who doesn't think it about the money isn't paying attention, seriously. And what is encouraging is that if you read any of the headlines in the financial papers, there's been a huge flight of capital towards ESG funds, which are these environmental, social and governance funds out there, which are really about investing in companies that are more responsible to people and the planet. There's also a very active dialogue that it's all optics and it's the same funds mm -hmm. just being window dressed as something else. There's also a dialogue around, well, we can't even judge this because there's so many ESG metrics out there and they're all different no one can see straight because it's not apples to apples. You don't really know how to compare. And so I characterize it as this way. Whenever there's something new, the new shiny squirrel comes along, like ESG and funds to that end, there's the flight of capital to it. Everyone's interested. Everyone's claiming bragging rights. And then people just as quickly will say, you're lying. You're just managing the optics. It's all about marketing. And then it'll all shake out, and then it'll start again with much more integrity. So it's kind of got to be a, f a rush to it, and then it's going to falter, and then there'll be more integrity, and it'll falter, and it will shake out. So I think Wall Street is showing up differently. I mean, here's a, a moment in time that I think is indicative of Wall Street. I mentioned Larry Fink, the CEO of the biggest money management firm in the world, $10.3 trillion under management. He does an annual letter each year. He's talked about the social purpose of a company being as, if not more important, than you know, its responsibility to shareholders. Yet at the same time, as I understand it, they have $80 billion invested in oil and gas companies across their portfolios. And he's been called out for that. And when they actually have to ask, he answers that question, he's like, Yes, we're aware, it's complicated, we need to transition, it's not as simple, and so on and so on. So I think they have one foot in the past and one foot in the future, and they're starting to look at it not through the lens of how much good we can do, but, oh my God, there's a massive marketplace opportunity here. All these companies innovating and answering new consumer demands. So I don't think the leopard's changed its spots. I don't think it can. But I do think they're starting to see the investment opportunity in a sustainable way in the context of more responsible companies. And it's early days, and that will increase. But there's a lot of duplicity still there right now. OK, I think that question was from Amy. Here's one from Shelby. Um, how, can capitalism, how can capitalism exist with purpose when companies don't want to pay living wages and there is such a wide income gap and strategy of profit over people and business? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair question. Like, as I said at the beginning, the vast majority of business isn't behaving well. It's so easy to go to evenings like this or conferences around conscious capitalism and sustainable brands and things and think, oh, my God, the whole business world has just woken up. It's, it's so lovely. It's not. <laughs> the vast majority is not. And actually, if you look at Just Capital's research, which is a very a firm with a great integrity, a nonprofit that does research in and around these issues, the number one issue for American consumers is a fair and living wage. It's not climate. It's fair and living wage. And you've seen things like in the restaurant industry, the average wage go from $15 an hour to $17 an hour to now being over $20 an hour, largely because... People who are stressed about COVID come in, they don't get what they order in two seconds flat, they're rude to the server, the server says, I'm out of here. And they can't keep people. And even Amazon has gone above with $20 an hour. So 
I think fair and living wage has sort of shot up as one of the most important topics out there, and it is shifting, but not shifting far enough when you consider how many people are living below the poverty line or near the poverty line. But I do think it's, it, it's rising, and I do think it's encouraging that it's the number one topic, you know, the most important issue to American consumers. As to how much progress we've made in this short period of time to fix it, I don't think very much. I think certain industries were ripe for it, manufacturing and the restaurant and hospitality industry, but across the board there's a long way to go. But I do think the awareness is rising. And it's rising for one thing. People are just quitting. They're just out of there. They've had enough. I think if we all sat back from COVID, and it's a, you know, I read all the reports and data in and around the great resignation or the great reshuffle or the great reset or whatever people want to call it, and it seems like people have just gone... I've had enough. Like, I don't need a job that bad, or I'll go and work somewhere else, but I want to be happier, and I'm not getting paid enough to be this miserable, and so I'm going somewhere else. And that's a real people problem for people who don't pay their, their people enough money. Uh, I love this question from Stephanie. It feels like a lot of responsibility is on the consumer, but often the more sustainable products are more expensive. What advice do you have for those that want to vote with their dollar but feel like they can't afford to? A couple of parts of the answer to that. And are you hearing the questions? Is it Can clearly? you guys hear me? Yeah, I just want to make yes? sure. Yes, okay. So when you think you're saving money because you need to by buying the non-sustainable product, you're ignoring the fact that it is costing you something far more valuable than money, ultimately. In the sense that if enough people do that, we're going to have more and more of these problems. So that's not to diminish how tight people's pocketbooks are and how close they live to the breadline in terms of what they're paid. Enormous respect for that. But you've really got to calibrate it carefully because if you are by those choices compounding the problem, that's not ideal. And the good news is that this wasn't the case five years ago and certainly not ten years ago, but the market forces and the economies of scale seem to be finally arriving where the sustainable alternative can be cost competitive. And in all the research that I read and all the work that we've done with brands like Timberland and so on is that it's still not the number one choice why someone will buy something. They're not going to go, oh, I'm going to choose a sustainable product. But it's like an insurance policy. I'll still get what I want and if it's sustainable, that seals the deal. There's a report that just came out from sustainable brands showing in Asia, sustainability has just tipped it where it's the number one concern of people, people when they're buying products. And when I talk to folks who run businesses like Gail and the folks at Expo West, they're starting to start to feel that the awareness and the anxiety around climate and everything is such that people are really starting to buy more of those products. And when they buy more of those products, they can sell more of them, the cost efficiencies are there, they can bring the prices down. So do know that when you make that conscious choice, even if it's a little bit more painful in the short term, you're enabling the forces that will make it cheaper in the long term, if that makes sense. Oh, great. Love it. Ask a, question. a brave soul at the front of the mic. Can you hear me? Well, this is now um, the mass Singer, and we'd like you to <laughs> sing for us and see, we see what happens. So, um, since we have a lot of students here, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I'm also in the impact entrepreneurship space. I have a lot of young uh, professionals or young students come to me and ask about how to build a career in the space. So my bias is I see a lot of these big companies and I love your, you know, your insights because you've been there. I feel like a lot of the CSR you know, thing, some of it is really like a marketing play. And um, I feel like the expertise, I mean, everything you said for me is like, you know, amen, because that's what I tell companies, whether you're a new company or an existing company, you have to start thinking about impact to differentiate yourself. But I also feel like the expertise in how to build that impact and the measurement of it and everything, which is what I love to do every day, is not really existing every, you know, enough there. But so how do, how do you see companies get prepared for that knowledge? And then what would be your advice to young professionals or the students here today if they want to work in that space, you know, what would be their, like, the best way to get in there and, and grow a career in that when, you know, I, I see, like, a lot of companies 
hire the fancy people to do CSR and they, you know, they have no background in this, so. Yeah, it's a great question. I actually faced a similar question um, 11 years ago where, you know how there's always one Australian at every party somewhere around the world? There's always one Australian. Mm -hmm. I was that one Australian over here in the States. Going, to, I had slept my butt all around the world thinking there was some version of success that I was missing out on and it was somewhere over there. It was, I was in London for a long time and then lots of different places in the States. And then I came to this moment where, actually, I think I want to do something to drive change. And that's a whole other story. But the question was, what, how do I do that? Do I start my own company? Do I do a non-profit? Do I work in a big organization? Like, where do you want to play? And for me, I thought, based on my background, I was lucky enough to have the experience with the big companies out there. And no amount of small social enterprises will fix the situation if all of these big bad boys out there are still making the mess that they are, bad boys or girls. And so I thought, listen, it's better to go in the engine room of all of these really complicated and inert and dysfunctional organizations and create problems for them, which is my choice. The alternative is for you to start a social enterprise. And I think the marketplace and access to capital and the readiness of consumers to reward you has never been higher. It really wasn't that easy five, even seven, year, seven, ten years ago. But now, you know, you can take off pretty quickly, especially if you've got the right TikTok things going on and so on. I mean, it really can drive business growth very, very quickly if you tell your message well. Um, as for the talent in there, I think what we're looking at is a moment in time as we course correct what we're doing. It used to be that the do-good aspect was carved off into the philanthropy of an organization. And then it used to be a bit of CSR, corporate social responsibility. It then became sustainability with a small s in the sense that supply chain management. Let's just not do wrong things that would really get us in trouble. And then it became sustainability with a big S, which is like, okay, we've got to look after our people as well. And now it's become purpose. And what I'm seeing is all these companies, these big ones, rushing over to establish their ESG credentials or to articulate which sustainable development goals they're committed to, or to become a B Corp. And they are hiring people furiously who know what on earth that means. Because you're right, the vast majority of companies aren't set up to understand that. And in my experience, most of the do-good stuff is carved off to the side rather than foundational to the entire business, or sustainability isn't talking to marketing, and the CMO can't even understand what the CSO is saying, but encouragingly, I've seen a big shift of, of, in the focus of purpose to go from not just the CSO, the Chief Sustainability Officer, to the CMO, the Chief Marketing Officer, but now it's going to the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer, and the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer. So these are all positive indications that these bigger companies are moving in the right direction and they're hiring for those roles. We're not there yet, but my gosh, we are so much better prepared for young students like you coming through today than we were even three or five years ago. And I say that because the climate emergency has accelerated it, and I say that because it COVID has accelerated the trouble we're in, the awareness, and I say that now because even with Ukraine, we're like, how is business showing up differently? The expectation that business has to play a clear and demonstrable role in these larger issues is undeniable now. So if you want to play in the corporate space, go like hell because they're desperate right now to find the right people. Okay, I'm going to combine a couple of the questions because there's some some similar themes. Um, uh, someone wants to know the, the the rules surrounding publicly traded companies. Do they have the same ability to lead with we as privately held companies? Um, if not, can we change regulation and what type should it be to produce a better social outcome? Uh, and along with that, someone said, what role should policymakers play? Should these ideas be enforceable? So, Yeah, I'll take the policy piece first just because it's not, a, it's not the private sector's responsibility alone. It's not the nonprofits or civil society, and it's not government. It's going to take, as you can imagine, all of these things because you need the policy to support new behaviours, to penalise bad behaviours like a carbon tax or something like that. At the same time, you need new companies doing good and big old companies doing less bad. You need it all. So the policy piece is huge and, you know, we'd be foolish not to think that a lot of the brands that are doing harm are spending millions and millions of dollars every year on lobbyists to keep things the way they are or make them worse. 
because that's the business they're in. Mm -hmm. um, as for Wall Street, it's an interesting one. You know, they, they're on the hook because they're interested in making money. And it's much less likely to make money out of companies that are not set up to succeed or be sustainable in the future. And so you're seeing, as I said, you know, the rise of, you know, um, capital. At the same time, the rise of capital that's being invested in um, responsible brands. You're also seeing that CEOs are being called out everywhere. You know, Mark Benioff of Salesforce or Larry Fink of BlackRock are getting up there and really challenging other CEOs around the world to do something differently. Um, so I think increasingly we're going to see Wall Street kind of turn over the companies that have been on the S&P 500 in the past and they're going to be new do-good companies that are going to come to the fore. If you actually look at the data, the, the, the S&P 500, which is, you know, these top 500 companies out there, has changed at an increasing rate, has turned over at an increasing rate over the last several decades. And so there's a real sense of insecurity in companies. It wasn't like GM was going to be on there for, you know, forever. ExxonMobil fell off the S&P 500 and lost 30% of its value. Um, you know, so... It's a perilous situation for companies that aren't paying attention, that aren't showing up and being responsive to today's marketplace, and aren't responding to the expectations of consumers, employees, and investors' needs. So I think Wall Street is always going to be about making money. I think they will look at the innovation opportunities and see the, you know, what can be captured in terms of capital and profit from that. But they're going to be very mindful that there's no guarantees anymore, and that you've got to respond to the reality of the world that we're in. And by doing so, you've got a better chance of making money by making the, the future a better place to be in. So I think Wall Street is headed in the right direction. It's got a long way to go. It speaks out of both sides of its mouth. But I think a combination of policy, private sector, and civil society participation is what's needed. And the more and more you do it, as I said before, the market forces take on a life of its own. And we're in that first 15% right now where you're turning the steering wheel and the G-forces are really, really hard. But when you get to the other side of it, it starts to get easier. And then we'll look back in the future and go, how on earth did a company like that survive for 30 years? Look at the harm it did to the environment. What were we thinking? We were idiots. And you'd be right. Okay, I'm afraid this is the last question. Um, I'm going to add a little bit to it at the end. So this is someone in the audience who says, I work for a large hospital, and the amount of waste is mind-boggling. They always say it's too expensive to recycle. How does the recycle business work in America? And I guess my add to that would be, you know, we all work in places, or I'm sure a lot of people work in places where they see that there's something that could be easily done. What do you say to those people who can who can see something that they could that could be done better, and how can they work within their own, own organizations to try and make that happen? I think the way that you frame that question is really important because I'm going to be cheeky for a second. I'm not saying it was inherent in that question, but I'm going to project that it was. How is somebody else going to fix that? How can recycling be done different? Why is waste this way? It's not anyone else's responsibility, it's all of our responsibilities. Not to buy, buy the products that make that possible, to suggest an idea that may be more effective in terms of waste. And so you're seeing circular economies where, you know, the life cycle of a product means that it comes back in rather than just be tossed into landfill and, and creates more waste, especially in industries like apparel and so on and so on. Um, you're seeing people repurposing products that are taking waste. I read today one company is taking masks, discarded PPE equipment masks and making phone charges out of them. So you're seeing a lot of innovation where companies are repurposing what would otherwise be wasted products. But I think, you know, we have to recognize that it's going to take a little bit of time and a little bit of capital investment to actually drive this change. But what we've got to give up is something even more fu fundamental, which is I think that we, the great sins of all of us, if I could use such a term, is that we want the thing at the cheapest, the easiest, and the most convenient. Every one of us, all the time. Not in an arrogant way, but we've almost been reared that way to expect you get what you want when you want it and it's as cost as little as possible or whatever. But maybe it isn't that easy. 
And maybe it does cost a little bit more. And maybe you don't get it when you want it, but it doesn't do harm to the planet or it doesn't create that waste. And so I'm always mindful that in as much as we set goals where we want to drive change, we've also got to, we've got to embrace a new mindset. Because without a new mindset, we're going to keep doing the same thing, but just play around the edges. The new mindset needs to be, life isn't going to be as convenient. Certain things may be a little bit more expensive, and I'm going to have to show up in new ways so that there isn't so much waste. So th that sort of answers your question, but the larger point is that I think we need a new mindset because I think that what creates problems like the waste is the presumption of convenience and cost and ease, putting ourselves first. But if we really look at it and go, okay, I'm complicit in the, the result of the consumption more broadly of this particular product, how can we do it differently where it doesn't create so much waste in the, in the first place? And I'll give you an example. I have a podcast called Lead With We that's on Spotify and Apple and it's on United Airlines. And I interviewed the uh, chief purpose officer of Hasbro today um, in the hotel before I came here. And there's an announcement that's public and she said that um, pretty soon every single Hasbro product, you know, they make Monopoly, Play-Doh, all these different things, will... Uh, they're doing away with packaging. It's not about recycling packaging, they're eliminating packaging, which was a very interesting conversation for me to hear that because toy, you know, like, toy companies are synonymous with plastic and things like that. And so they're totally re-engineering what they're doing. And so that's an example of what I mean. Let's not sort of try and fix, let's not do something remedial and leave the problem intact. Let's do something preventative to avoid the problem in the first place. And that may be a little bit uncomfortable for all of us, but it's sure as hell more comfortable than the future we're facing if we keep doing what we're doing. One fun fact, and then I'll stop. According to The Guardian, there will be more plastic in the ocean by weight than fish by 2050. Think about that. More plastic by weight than fish in the ocean. You know... We've got to change what we're doing. We have to. We have to. Otherwise, we're putting ourselves out of business. I don't know any other species in the natural world that poisons its food, poisons its soil, poisons its oil, robs it, I mean, its air, robs itself of water. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it is hard to read an audience full of mass, but I'm going to say people are leaving inspired. I know I certainly am. So That's a um, fair comment. You. I have no idea what's going on behind those faces. <laughs> I know. I wish you could all thank just smile. So Let's give a great. round of applause. Mm -hmm. Simon, Gail, thank you, very much. thank you so much. I can, I can almost feel the hunger for connection in the audience. There, we have so many questions that were unasked. Um, but I think I'll do something with the Soka Performing Arts Center about a post on Facebook so we can have a discussion or something. We'll either do that or at the Soka Bridges to Business program. And I want to thank you, Simon, for mentioning to the students that they can be starting social enterprises. Soka is making many opportunities available. I think um, our dean of faculty recently connected us with USD. We have an extended master's program in social innovation. We have a course offered, an independent credit course offered by Dr. Brian Penpraise on medical innovation, research, and entrepreneurship. We have the Bridges to Business program. And we want to encourage the SOCA students and all students, and actually all of us, to think of ways to innovate and show up differently. Um, Simon's going to be signing books in the lobby, so you can continue the conversation with him. And yeah. Gail. Gail has given us free pizzas for the SOCA students. Sorry, the rest of you can probably afford them. So I'm going to have, these are coupons for Cauliflower Pizza. And as Anthea uh, said, wow, when you eat them, they're really great. So when you're getting your book signed, if you're a SOCA student, just let Simon know I'll have someone next to him to give you your free pizza coupon. Thank you all for coming. Please scan the program QR code. See what's up at the Soka Performing Arts Center. We loved having you here. Thanks. And, and if anyone has a question that I haven't answered, I, I'm deeply committed to the role that you can play. Simon at WeFirstBranding.com. Simon at WeFirstBranding.com. That comes directly to me. 
So don't, if, you, if you've got a burning question, just email me, and I'm happy to spend time afterwards answering your question so you can move forward and we can make a difference together. So Simon at wefirstbranding.com. <laughs> <laughs>